thing because I didn't. So all those uh, precious tidbits about late assignments, etc., is lost on everyone else. That's all right. Tell your friends. Uh, okay, so you are all friends. You just don't know it. Or maybe you are. I don't know. Um, you will be. So uh, today we're going to finish statistics. I mean, I wouldn't really call it that. It's touching on statistics topics. Uh, and then we kind of float out of there. Uh, heads up for next week, we are going to start chapter one of that uh, textbook that I, I don't know why I did air quotes. It's a real textbook. Um, but we're going to start chapter one, uh, which is just talking about different functions. Right, and so we're gonna get into just developing mostly terminology and just kind of like what they look like, things like that. And so uh, we will start, oops, well, it's cause I'm plugged in, I think. We will, I don't know what happened here. We will start chapter one next week chapter one the sections that we're supposed to be doing is really big and I don't know it's really wordy so I would say just skim the chapter right so you have an idea of what's coming up we'll talk about like obviously I'll talk about it basically talk through the textbook with you in class um, so skim the textbook so you've seen it once, and then um, we'll go through it together. So skim the first three sections, let's say. Uh, to prepare for next week. Assignment number one is the one I just handed out is due on Tuesday. And number two is due on Thursday. Let's do a little bit of review just quickly, because we do have a lot to get through today. Uh, but just briefly, we started statistics, right? And so we talked about measures of center and measures of spread. We almost got through the example, so we'll finish up the example. But as a quick review, we talked about measures of center. Right? First one being the mean, I can't remember what order I did them, but let's say the mean, the mean is just the average. The average, which we denote by X bar as the sum of X over N. The second one is the median. The median, remember, is robust outliers, so it can handle kind of extreme values, right? And so the median is just the central value. So you have to sort your data from smallest to largest, and then I usually just boop, boop, boop my way in to the middle. If I land on two values, I have to take the average, right? And that's my median. Or but there's no formula for the median. Okay. Uh, and then the mode is pretty boring. It's just the most frequently occurring value, right? You can have multiple modes, that's fine, but it's <laughs> the most frequently occurring value.
Then we talked about measures of spread. So usually we want to know, okay, what's the central value? Mostly because that's our best guess at what we're expecting to see, right? So what's the most common thing that we're seeing here? Okay, it's the center and we've got a few options, right? And then we wanna know, okay, how spread out is our data, right? Because if we have very little spread, then we're expecting things to be really close to the center, right? If we have a huge spread, then we're saying, okay, well, the center is, is a good guess, right? But it could have uh, this wide variety. And so the first one we talked about was the MAD, the mean absolute distance, which we calculate as the sum of the absolute value of X minus X bar over M. Okay. Essentially the average distance from the mean. Well, it is. So it's the average distance from the mean. And we managed to get through examples of all of these that we've talked about so far. And then today we'll finish off examples of the variance and the standard deviation. But we did talk about what they are, the variance is the sum of x minus x bar squared over n minus one. Okay. Doing very similar things to as the, the mad, right? Taking the distance, so that error term x minus x bar, so each value is some distance away from the mean, right? And then in instead of taking the absolute value, we square the value. But remember, the, if you square even a negative number, it becomes positive, right? And so, uh, so it does the same thing as the absolute value with the added bonus of larger distances are amplified, right? For example, a, a distance of one is just squared, is just gonna be one, right? But a distance of three is gonna be amplified to nine, Right, and so on and so forth. So these bigger distances, so the further things are away from the mean, they're gonna make the variance bigger. And then we divide by n minus one, and that's just a field quirk. Otherwise it doesn't look like the population. <laughs> but it's basically the same, right? And ran minus one. <laughs> you have to use n minus one, but I'm just saying it's a little silly. And then, so the variance is just the squared deviances from the mean and then over n minus one, there's not really a, a good way to say it, but it is a measure of spread. It's uh, one of the most common measures of spread. And then we said, well, the standard deviation is the square root of the variance. And thus the variance is the standard deviation squared, right? So if you know one, you know the other. So recall, that's kind of our, the end of our review and now we'll start with the calculating the variance and the standard deviation. Any questions though before we do? So recall we had two data sets that we're working with. So data set number one, Was what? Let's see here. Oh, I had a typo. We had six, seven, three, two, eight, two, and seven. I changed the two. And we have data set number two. Six, five, four. Five, six, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. 
my writing is just loftier up top, I guess. It's my brain. It communicates the spread by how I write. It's wild. All right. So I think it was part uh, A, B, C, D, E. Find the variance. Let's just do one of these. Well, I guess, no, we've got a lot to go through. So find the variance of data set number one. Okay. So remember the variance is the sum of x minus x bar squared over n minus one. Okay. That looks nasty, right. but we can kind of break it down and say, okay, well, the first thing I need to do is I need to find the mean, right? Because from each value, I have to subtract the mean, right? And so I'm gonna find the mean, or I think we had the mean is five, right? It forced it to be five for both of them. Right, and so we already know the mean. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take away five from each data point, right, and see the distance, which we already did with the mat, right? Then instead of taking the absolute value, we're gonna square each of them. And so when I'm calculating variances and standard deviations, I like to make a table. And so what that table looks like, because I like to kind of work methodically through these things so that they're not so, uh, burdensome. I start with my x on this side and below it I'm going to list my data points right, to make a table. So I'm going to write 6, 7, 3, 2, 8, 2, 7. Okay. Do that. Yeah. And then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to split this up here. In this column, I'm going to find x minus x bar. One thing, because I did this in a different class yesterday, uh, and I completely forgot because I'm out of practice, is because I want to square each of these values, and if you've got big values that you're dealing with, you might not want to go back and then square them. And so what we're going to do is we're just going to write out at the same time what that value squared is. And so you don't have to make two columns, but I like to just show my work, right, and kind of uh, work my way through it methodically, like I said. So remember, x bar we know x bar is five. So in the first column, we're gonna have six minus five is one. And then one squared is one. That one I can handle without my calculator. But I do want to get used to working with this calculator and I don't do math in my head. So there's that too. Okay. The next one, seven minus five is so far so good. Is two away from five. And so if we square that, right, we get two squared is four. I'm just working our way through these. 3 minus 5 is negative 2. Right. You'll want to be careful because if you just do negative 2 on your calculator and then squared, it gives you negative 4, but that's not right. right? And so if you're dealing with a negative, you'll have to put it in brackets because I think what this calculator is doing is it's saying negative and then 2 squared is negative 4. 
right? And that's not true. So we want the negative two to hang together and then square that. So you can use your brackets here if you use a bracket and then negative two and bracket and then square it, then you get positive four, right? So we get negative two squared is also four. Two minus five, <coughs> negative three, negative three squared is nine. A minus five is three, three squared is nine. Two minus five, negative three. Maybe I didn't need my calculator. Nine, seven minus five is two, two squared is four. So now, if we go back to our equation, right, we want, so we have each of these terms, right, the x minus x squared <coughs> terms, or x bar squared. We want the sum of them, right, so what we're going to do is we're just going to add up 1 plus 4 plus 4 plus 9 plus 9 plus 9, and that makes this whole term. And so if we add these all up, and I'll show it down here at the bottom, the sum of x minus x bar squared is 1 plus 4. So I'll just put a little line here. 1 plus 4 plus 4 plus 9 plus 9 plus 9 plus 4. Oops. Which is what? 1 plus 4 plus 4 plus 9 plus 9 plus 9 plus 4 is 40. Hey, that's nice. And so now we know that the variance is the sum of x minus x bar squared over n minus 1. We can replace that whole sum with 40, because that's what we just found, over n. How many data points do we have? We have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So 7 minus 1. So 40 divided by 6. Oops. 6.6. .6. which I'll round to 6.67. All right. What's the standard deviation if we, so we were asked to find the variance, right? what is the standard deviation of data set number one remember the variance is the standard deviation squared it gets a little tricky because uh, and I can't remember if I mentioned it, but I'll mention it now. When we uh, abbreviate standard deviation in writing, we usually use SD. But when we use the standard deviation in math, we use a lowercase s. And so, because having two, uh, two values in there, s and d, those could represent two different things, right? So we just have s in our calculations. Uh, but just to emphasize that we mean the standard deviation in our writing, we use SD. Okay. And so, abbreviated SD in writing use a lowercase s in, cal in math, let's say.
So if the variance is the standard deviation squared, then the standard deviation is the, the square root of the variance. I'll throw in a so in there. How about? Yeah. S in our case, if it's the square root of the variance, it's going to be the square root of 6.67, or I'm going to keep all my decimal places on my screen here and just take the square root. So there's a square root button. And then it's asking for what do you want to take the square root of? And then there's this uh, convenient answer button. All right, so you can just put in and it'll just plug in the previous answer that it just gave you. Right? And then equals. And as a decimal, I get 2.58198897. To two decimal places, I get 2.58. Now, I'll give you just a, a couple of minutes to find the standard deviation of data set number two. We'll go through, make sure it's right. So find the standard deviation of data set number two, which is 6545645. I guess I could pause this. But I'm so speedy. No, probably not. All right, so uh, x bar is five. There's a page break, so I got a six, six, five, four, five, six, four, five. X minus X bar, and then X minus X bar squared. Six minus five is one. Oh, I was thinking this looks familiar. Six and six. I guess I both they both start with six. I didn't realize that until now. Wait, am I doing the wrong one? No, looks fine. Uh, and one squared is one. 5 minus 5 is 0. 0 squared is 0. 4 minus 5 is negative 1. Negative 1 squared is 1. 5 minus 5 is 0. 0 squared is 0. 6 minus 5 is 1. 1 squared is 1. 4 minus 5 is negative 1. Oops, can't write anymore. Negative 1 squared is 1. 5 minus 5 is 0. 0 squared is 0. Phew. The sum of these, the sum of x minus x bar squared is 1 plus 0 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 0. Squeeze that in. 1, 2, 3, 4. Nice. Right. This confirms what we saw just by looking at the data, right? We said, okay, if you had to look at data set number one and data set number two, which one has more spread? You said data set number one, right? Because you can just look at it and have a good idea, even though those numbers are all fairly similar, right? But when we add the, the squared differences all up, we get a huge, um, 
difference. And so the variance is the sum of the x's minus x bar squared over n minus 1, which is 4 over 7 minus 1, which is 4 over 6. Oops. Point six six repeating. I'm going to round that to 0.67, the so two decimal places. The standard deviation is the square root of the variance. I shouldn't say SD, I should just do S. We're doing a calculation here. So the standard deviation is the square root of 0.67, or what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep all my decimal places on my calculator. Right, and just do the square root of the previous answer, which is 0.816496508.09. Okay. To two decimal places, roughly 0.82. Is that what you guys got? Great. Now, is it important to be able to calculate the standard deviation by hand? Not at all. Is the whole point of doing this, being able to have a formula that looks as nasty as this and being able to pick it apart and methodically work through it to be able to solve it? Yeah, right. And so um, I, I would bet money on it would take you probably less than two minutes to be able to find a, a standard deviation calculator online, plug in those values and give me the standard deviation. So that's, that's not important, right? We can find the standard deviation easily uh, using any sort of uh, kind of computing, right? Uh, so that's not the point, but the point is to be able to see something like that and not be scared, right? You can break it down and just kind of approach it from the, the smallest and then work our way out. Right. So, great. <clears throat> Any questions about those calculations? No, oh, pretty good. All right. So, <clears throat> we said earlier, or last day, that the goal of statistics is to be able to take sample information to learn about the population, right? So we're gonna calculate a, an average, for example, from a sample, and then what does that tell us about the average of the population, right? And so we know that our sample average isn't gonna be exactly the population average. That doesn't make sense, right? And even if we collected a different sample, we would get a slightly different average so they're not even the same, right? And so things move around. And so to communicate this uncertainty in real life, IRL, we do this all the time, right? We have our best guess. So I ask you, how far is it from me to the door, right? We guess. I don't know, I'm really bad. 10 meters? I don't know. But because I'm not very confident, I would say in my initial guess, I would say plus or minus uh, two meters, right? giving myself a big buffer. Right? And so we do that in stats too. We say, okay, well, here's my best guess. Here's my sample average. That's my best guess at what the population might look like. And then we build on these error bounds right? to say, well, somewhere in here, is where I'm confident that the population mean is, right? Because the population mean in this situation is if we took some sort of measuring device and actually measured from me to the door, right? And so, uh, so that would be the true distance to the door, right? And that would be the same as the population mean, right? And so the goal, the goal of statistics is to use sample information to 
to learn about the population. Our best guess is our estimate, or we call, we call it our estimate. So our best guess is called the estimate. But since we know the estimate, which to bring it back to, so it could be anything that we've calculated from our sample, but the most common thing is our sample mean, right, for example. I'll throw a little example. The, I guess it's EG. For example, the sample mean, right? So since we know our estimate has some error in it, right? So is not exactly the same as the population equivalent. For example, the population mean, we use, I'll put in quotes, uh, error bounds, or actually, I'll use the proper term. We use confidence intervals. We use confidence intervals. to communicate how confident we are in our estimate, right? How confident we are in our estimate. So, and we use confidence intervals all the time, right? Because, right, I ask you, okay, well, yeah, same, same example, right? How far is it from you to the door? I say 10 meters plus or minus two meters. And then you ask, well, how confident are you? And I'll throw on a, a percentage confidence level, right? And so I'll say, oh, I'm 90% uh, confident. It's not very confident. Yeah. Okay, but that specific example relies on your own personal confidence, which is emotional and self perspective based. Yes. So don't worry, there's math for it. Okay, <laughs> okay. but um, yeah, and totally. And actually, we still get to choose our confidence level. So we just say, oh, I want to be 95% confident. And then that'll dictate our bounds, right? I want to be 90% confident. Right? Uh, if we think about, okay, what would it mean? Because uh, someone asked me one time, they're like, well, why wouldn't you just build 100% confidence intervals, right? To have a 100% confidence interval um, would mean, well, my estimate is, is 10 meters to the door, plus or minus 100 meters. I'm 100% confident that the true distance from me to the door is somewhere in there, right? But it's not very useful, right? And so we have to have this trade-off between precision and confidence. So industry standard is 95%. It's kind of been agreed that, okay, 95%, you get a, a pretty decent, uh, decently tight 
interval, right? But you're still 95% confident, which feels pretty good, right? Uh, it depends on what field you're in. I suspect things like chemistry, they wanna be very, very, very confident. So they'll do 99% confidence intervals, for example, right? And so you can bump up your interval, um, but for our class here, and to start off with, we're gonna start with just 95% confidence intervals. But first let's talk about what it looks like. So we said, okay, well, my estimate, and this is a general confidence interval. So you can build confidence intervals for a lot of things. We'll start with just the mean, but then we could talk about the proportion of things. We could talk about the difference in the means. We could talk about the mean difference, which is uh, different. Uh, we could talk about we could talk about a lot of things. Of course, we won't be able to do that here today. Um, but you'll have to join me in stats, and then we'll do it. How about? Okay. Uh, but the general idea is you have some estimate. And then you have what we call a margin of error. Okay. So you do plus or minus some margin of error. <clears throat> to build a confidence interval, for a one sample mean, kind of the lowest of the low, the very basics, right? We use X bar. We've seen that before. That's our sample mean, right? And that is our estimate. That's our best guess at what the population mean is. And then plus minus. So that's how we get these bounds, right? Plus minus, so we add a little, minus a little, right? get this interval. And I'm gonna write it out and then I'm gonna simplify it, right? And so we have technically what's called a T star okay, times S over the square root of N. Okay. So, for the case of a single mean, sample mean, this is how we find our margin of error, right? So depending on what your estimate is, how you find your margin of error is gonna change, right? We're gonna swap out T star because that's how we change our confidence level. So what we were talking about just now, right? So for a 95% confidence interval, we use two a value of two here. So for us, we're just gonna use two times the S over root N, right? S, remember, is the sample standard deviation that you just were able to calculate. And then over the square root of N, which is your sample size. So these things we've seen, right? The only thing that's new here is the T star, which for now, we're just gonna swap out with two. If you wanted to be 99% confident, you would use three, right? There's more strict numbers. It's actually 1.96, but I think we can all agree that 1.96 is basically two, right? And so, uh, yeah. Um, the Z distribution. So we're working, so it, it, yeah, the Z and the T distribution, depends so you have to, anyways you have degrees of freedom I'll just say it but don't worry don't listen uh, so the t distribution depends on your degrees of freedom which depends on your sample size and so it just uh, at the end of the day now listen uh, tune back in uh, your sample size dictates how confident you can be right with a small sample size there's no way that we can be very confident Right, and so that's gonna be reflected in this T star. When we use two, it, it's fine, uh, but it does assume that we have a large enough sample size, so around 30, yeah. Is there a, is there a percentage base for the sample size for 
or something like that, you can say like, okay, so we sample 10% of whatever our base is that way. Like, is there a So again, this is kind of a sneak preview, uh, but the rules say, okay, well, yeah, you have to have a random sample. It has to be large enough, right? Larger than 30, let's say, but it can't be too big. So it can't actually exceed 10% of the population because they have to be independent. So, uh, so there's rules like that where, yeah, you always want a big sample. And honestly, if you have a huge sample, that's great, right? I wouldn't worry about it. Um, but yeah, so you always want to go shoot for as large a sample as you can get, can afford, right? Whatever. Um, so bigger the better. And notice here that as n increases, right, this term is going to decrease, so it's going to get lower. And this is just 2, right? So 2 times a smaller number, this section is going to shrink. And so now we're more and more precise at the same confidence level, right? And so what happens is as we increase our sample size, right, we get a better and better and better estimate, right? And a better and better interval, right? So we can be more sure or more confident in our information. So. For now, we let T star be 2 for a 95% confidence interval. As n increases, right, s over root n decreases, so t, or let's use 2, so 2 times s over root n also decreases. Decreases. Therefore, as the sample size, right, n increases, the margin of error, because remember, that whole chunk is the margin of error, the margin of error decreases. And we can be more confident or more, yeah, I'll just say more confident. It's actually precision we're talking about. More confident in our estimate. Any questions about that? Yeah. So, like a hundred percent sample size of the population would have like hundred percent precision because you're surveying every. But then that wouldn't yeah. really be specific to that point of a survey. Right? Yeah. So then, if you have the population, you don't need stats anymore. Because you just know. Because you just know you can just calculate everything that you could possibly want to know. You have. Yeah. Right. And so then you don't need it. Right. But yeah, you, so you're a hundred percent precise. Yeah. Right. Good. And so, um, just a word of caution. Some, uh, if you're reading, you know, articles like journal articles or things like that, some works will put out X bar plus minus the standard deviation, they'll make note of it, right? They'll make it look like a confidence interval, but it's not really, right? And so 
uh, just a, a caution. Some articles will give the standard deviation. I guess I should have S. Um, but they should make note of it. It, it wouldn't get published if they didn't make a note of what they were using, uh, but they should make note of it Right. So be careful when reading articles. Right. Because that's not a confidence interval, right? That's just your estimate plus or minus the spread, which is fine too. Uh, it's just not as sophisticated. So that's all we'll be able to talk about in terms of confidence intervals. Um, but I guess you guys deal with them because Allison said, oh, it'd be really great if you could just touch on confidence intervals, right? And then um, I guess you see them at some point, right? But now you know that at its core, you're going to have some estimate and then you've got some bounds on there, some mar a margin of error, depending on what your estimate is, it's going to tell you how to calculate it. Uh, but often I suspect that you're just going to be reading these things, right? And then you'll kind of know what's going on. Right? Kind of. What is it uh, Allison likes to say? teach him enough stats to make him dangerous <laughs> about the 121 so stat 121 we teach you just enough to make you dangerous and let you out yeah. the idea is that yeah <laughs> yes uh, a colleague of mine uh, he he's from Macau so he's Chinese and so he always used to say if you can't convince them, confuse them. So that's my, my teaching philosophy. No. <laughs> All right. Uh, so that's kind of just touching on confidence intervals. And then now let's talk about regression. Again, just kind of be a little salt and pepper of regression. Regression. is basically just fitting a line of best fit, which I'm sure that you've done at some point in high school or whatever, but it's just fitting a line of best fit. Fitting a line of best fit. I guess drawing a line of best fit, but we usually say fitting. Model. Okay. So, Imagine you've got two variables that you want to compare. How would you show them, right? You would visualize them with a scatter plot. And so it would, might look something like this, right? And so this is a scatter plot. We visualize the relationship between two variables to, I'm going to throw in numerical variables, numerical variables using a scatter plot. A scatter plot or uh, 
if you take stats, I'll show you how to make a cat or plot. It replaces all the dots with cats. Uh, it's a cat or plot. <laughs> Pretty fun. Uh, not important, but really fun. Okay. And so as a rule, right, remember this is your x-axis and this is your y-axis. Okay. As a rule, we put our response variable, which we haven't really had a chance to talk about, the, but the response, or it can also be called the dependent variable. Goes on the y-axis and your explanatory. I like the term uh, response and explanatory because it has x and it goes in the x-axis. Explanatory variable. Explanatory or independent variable goes on the x-axis. So the reason that you collected this data initially was because you think that this variable is affected by changes in this variable. Right. Given our kind of fake dot 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 here, yeah, it looks like there's some sort of relationship because there is a trend. Right? And so we can model that trend using a regression line. We're not going to talk about how to calculate them or how to how were they're even found actually. I'm just going to give you a straight line equation. Okay. But remember, in general, if you've got a straight line, we talked briefly about the equations of a straight line as y equals mx plus b. Did we? I'm getting my beginning a term. We cover all the same stuff in all the classes and now I'm, I'm jumbled. But anyways, the equation of a straight line is y equals mx plus b. Right. Maybe we didn't yet. Now we are. Here we are. Okay. To throw a little loop in things, I'm going to put a hat on the y, just to be. Um... <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> Let's write about down here. So we've got y hat is mx plus b. Okay. Y hat, the hat just says it's a predicted value. Okay. So it's the predicted value of y Whatever's attached to the x is the slope. Your x is just the explanatory variable. We leave that open so that we can plug in any value of x that we want to get some predicted value of y. Right? And so this is your explanatory variable. And B, or whatever is on its own, is the intercept. I guess I should say Y intercept. But typically, the default for intercept is the Y intercept. It's pretty rare that we care about the X intercept. So. We can have an equation for the straight line. And the, what we do is, for example, if I tell you that y hat is 2x plus 1, then I can ask you, what is the predicted value of y when x is 4? What is the predicted value of y when x is 4. Okay. 
if you had your equation or your, sorry, your graph with the axes all marked out, your best guess at the prediction would be, okay, so say here at some random spot, this is x equals four. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna trace up to the line, right? And then I'm gonna go over here and that's my predicted value of y. But by plugging in x equals four into that equation, I'm gonna find the exact value of y that corresponds to that value of x, right, on the line. And so y hat is two x plus one. When x is four, we get two times four plus one. Eight plus one is nine. And so our predicted value of y is nine when x is four. And so that's how we're gonna use these regression equations. Guess I should keep my y hat on the side here. Okay. So when I give you a scatter plot, right, you should be able to describe the relationship, right? That's kind of the, the basics of regression is describing the relationship between two variables. Okay. So to describe the relationship, the relationship between two variables, We need to discuss three things. We need to discuss three things. The first one is, do we have a strong or a weak relationship? So do we have a strong or a weak relationship. What does that look like? A strong relationship might look something like do, 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 right here, right? So you've got this clear pattern, right? As soon as you see a clear trend, you have a strong relationship. This is strong. Just as a little example here, if you have something like, like this, right, where things might be moving in the upwards direction, we can't really see, right, then you have a weak relationship. Now, again, depending on, uh, I don't know how rigid you guys are in your field, but uh, I just use the two classifications. You could say moderately strong or moderately weak. Uh, there's like, I think psychology, they break it down into like, there's like eight increments, strong to weak, and it's just really confusing. So, um, wait, what? Sorry, oh. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, no, I'm just talking about, like, because I'll just talk about strong or weak, but I know they'll do, like, uh, all these little breakdowns, moderately strong, relative, like, there's, like, all these uh, hardcore ways, but I'll just go with either it's strong or it's weak. Yeah. Um, you could back a little bit, but, uh, like, the y equals mx plus b. Yeah. Um, where do you get, or maybe we're getting into it, but where do you get, like, the slope and from. So there, you can calculate them, um, but we're not going to do that here in this course. Okay. You'd have to wait for stats. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to give them to you. Okay. Um, so you're either going to classify a relationship as strong or weak. The second thing you're going to have to talk about is whether you have a positive or a negative relationship. 
So a positive or a negative relationship. A positive relationship is one that starts in the bottom corner and just kind of goes up, up, up. And of course, if you start at the top and then you're tanking, this is a negative relationship. The last thing you're going to have to talk about is whether you have a linear or we're just going to break it down to linear or nonlinear relationship. Once we talk about different functions, then maybe you could say there's a, an exponential relationship or uh, something like that, right? Once you've seen more shapes, but for now and for these questions, we'll be looking at linear relationships, meaning do they look like a straight line, right? is a straight line model appropriate? And so linear or nonlinear, there's only one kind of example for a linear relationship. It's if it looks something like that or could be negative to, my default is a positive relationship. Glass half full. So a linear relationship, anything where there's some sort of curvature or even, um, I don't know, something jagged or a really common nonlinear relationship is the exponential growth. Okay. So when there's a, a distinct curvature, and depending on how bad it is, right, the curve, sometimes you can get away with fitting a straight line, right? But fitting a straight line through something like this doesn't do a good job of predicting future values, right? Um, one thing that you can do uh, is you can transform your nonlinear relationship, make it linear, right? Force it to be linear and then model it. Um, that's a trick you can use, but don't worry, I'm not getting into it. Okay. All right, so those are the three things that you want to talk about if you have to describe the relationship between two variables, and that's on your assignment two, so you'll want to make a note of that. Okay. <clears throat> We have a, a measure of the strength or kind of how good our model is, right? So how good is our line of best fit, right? Is it a strong relationship so that we can put a lot of stock into this line of best fit? Or do we have a weak relationship uh, so that, well, yeah, our line could kind of move around a little bit and it wouldn't really matter, right? And so, to measure how well a linear model, right? For example, y hat is mx plus b, that's a linear model. How well a linear model fits the data we use R squared, capital R squared. R squared, oh. R squared is the percentage of variability in Y, and here I'm just blabbing here, but um, I have to have said it, the percentage of variability in Y captured by the least squares regression line on X, right? 
it basically tells us how well our line fits, right? R squared basically tells us how well our line fits. So I'm going to write R squared can take on values between 0 and 1. Okay. And R squared of 0 means that there is no relationship. So completely random scatter. And you could move your line around any which way, and it wouldn't actually matter because your predictions are going to be bunk anyways. Oh, yeah, you bet. Or on the other end, an R squared of one, I can assure you will never happen. That's when every single point is exactly on the line, right? So that would be a perfect relationship. Perfect relationship or perfectly linear because it only works for straight lines relationship. That's all we'll deal with for now, though. If R squared is between 0 and 1, that makes it a proportion, right? which means that we could convert it to a percentage. And so it's, and like I said in the definition, right, R squared is a percentage, so usually we convert it to a percentage. And so, uh, since R squared is between zero and one, oops, it is a proportion which can be rewritten as a percentage by multiplying by a hundred percent. I'd say And R squared over 0.5 is pretty good. And so it doesn't take a whole lot to have a fairly decent looking model. And R squared of 0.5 is a fairly decent model. Again, it depends on what you're measuring, right? uh, what field you're in, right? Kind of depends. Um, and I think as you go on further, right, you'll pick up what a good R squared would be for you. Uh, for example, I'd say 0.5 is fine. Usually you're kind of shooting for 0.6, something like that, right? But if you have a look at your assignment two, on the back, there's a scatter plot about uh, bicarbonate content and pH. Right? So we're looking at that relationship. And at the very bottom, I give you the R squared is 0.115. That's low, right? But we can still see a relationship. Right? It's just not very strong, right? And so there is a relationship because I can say, okay, well, I'm looking here and yeah, I could fit bands around that and it'd be okay, right? Uh, and so even an R squared of 0.115, you can still see a pattern, right? And so it's still pretty good. Uh, it's just 
the higher, the better for our squared. Okay. All right. Any questions? Um, did we, like, I just going over the assignment. Yeah. And um, for question three, uh, I'm not sure it's relating to like what we learned with the y equals mx plus b. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe I'm just oh. obvious, but it looks like you don't have this. There isn't. So on question three, I kind of kept it in there. I, um, you're right, because I debated whether I should encourage this type of uh, approximation, right? All it's saying is, okay, if you don't have a model, then if X is seven, so here you pick seven, go up to the line and trace over, what's your best guess? Okay. Right, and so it's actually kind of a, a basic version of question four. So you're just eyeballing it. Yeah. And then let's see here. Same thing for part B. And then for part C, just kind of figuring out, so not a confidence interval because we don't really know how you'd have to have the standard deviation and the sample size, which you don't have. Uh, right. And so I'm just looking for, Okay, so that's your estimate, but plus minus what, right? Looking at your data, what would you guess would be your plus minus range? And then D, just kind of uh, blab your way through it. Whenever I have something kind of, um, do you believe a model built using this data, right? Uh, as long as you argue what you believe, I can't, I can't say, no, that's wrong, or I can say, yeah, that's right, right? But I can't say, no, that's wrong, because if, if that's what you believe in, and as long as you argue it logically, who am I to say, right? And so sometimes there are things that um, they just kind of have to argue your way to. Yeah? And so... The last thing I want to talk about is given y hat is mx plus b, right? question number four, I give you the slope and the intercept, right? but then we might want to know, okay, well, what is the slope and what is the intercept, right? So what's the definition? And usually what we want to ask ourselves it, or ourselves is, is the intercept meaningful, right? Remember the intercept is where this line is going to cross the Y axis. Okay. When I ask if it's meaningful or not, really what I'm asking is, well, that's the point where X equals zero, right? Are you ever going to care about what happens when X is zero, right? The line is going to cross the y-axis one way or another, right? Lines continue forever and ever, right? We're only concerned with a little bit. So when I ask you, uh, is the intercept meaningful, right? I'm asking you to think about, well, do I care about x being zero, right? Often it's no, right? Sometimes if x is temperature, for example, then yeah, sure, I could care about zero degrees Celsius, right? line keeps going. And so the slope, m is the slope, okay, which I mean, you know how to calculate rise over run, uh, but in stats we kind of use a, a more sophisticated formula, right, where you don't have to kind of plot it out. Um, but like I said, I'll just give you the slope. But the slope is um, the increase in the predicted value of y for each unit increase in x is the increase in the predicted value of y.
for each unit increase in x. So if we're just looking at how does the slope affect the predicted value of y, holding b steady, right? you can even let it be 0 if you want to simplify things, right? then the slope right, is going to be the increase in the predicted value of y for each unit increase in x. Right? So when x goes from 0 to 1, our predicted value goes from 0 to the slope times 1. If I go from 1 to 2, it goes uh, the predicted value of y, or the predicted value of y times the slope times 2 from 1. And so uh, for each unit increase in x, we're going to see a slope increase in the predicted value of y. So it's just, is the ratio of change? It's a, it's a rate of change, right? So like how quickly things are increasing. And it can be negative too, right? If you have a negative or a negative uh, relationship, your slope has to be negative. But usually the one that we're concerned about is B, which is the Y intercept. Intercept. The y-intercept is the predicted value of y when x is 0. Is the predicted value of y when x is 0. We have to have the y-intercept because it anchors our line, right? And so I'm not asking, can you get rid of it? The y-intercept, though, is only meaningful if x can be 0. And so the y-intercept is only meaningful if x can be 0. If you're uh, looking at rental price, prices for an apartment, for example, right, and you look at the square footage, right, so the price is dependent on the square footage. And so then we've got this model that we're looking at, right, presumably as the square footage increases, the price also increases. Right? And so we've got this positive relationship, probably linear, right? And so, uh, but then if I ask you, okay, well, what's the predicted rental price of a property with zero square feet? You would say, well, that, I, who cares, right? It's not meaningful, right? And so, uh, so that's why you have to ask yourself, okay, do I care about X being zero, right? And especially if you have, a scatter plot like this, a pretty good hint is if x goes to zero and you've got data over zero, then yeah, you probably care about x being zero because it's clearly happening, right? Whereas here, our scatter plot on the back of assignment two is it just goes to x equals six. So it's clearly, it doesn't have any data around uh, x equals zero. And so, I mean, not to give you the assignment, but um, does it make sense to have a pH of zero in your well water? Probably not. And so, um, so that's what you would argue. Right? Sometimes it's a little bit, uh, I don't know, you could go either way. So you could argue it either way, right? As long as you latch on to the fact that, well, the intercept is when x equals zero. So as long as you're arguing around can x be zero or not, right, you're safe. So if you think about just if you want to have b, right, just kind of looking at this 
logically, right? The y-intercept is the predicted value of y when x is 0. Right? If x is 0, this goes away, and then you've got y hat equals b, right? the predicted value of y when x is 0. Okay. All right. Let's make sure you can do it all. Great. Phew. Um, any questions? I thought that was going to take way longer. Maybe I went too fast. I don't know. But anyways, I'll give you time to work on the assignments. But if there are, yeah, question? Um, are we going to be looking for groupings within clusters? No, this is it for us, for stats. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but definitely, we will be doing stuff like that. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, any other questions? No? Take it back. Okay. Uh, all right. Then uh, you're free to do whatever you want. You can take the time to work on the assignment. So, first one is due on Tuesday. And remember to skim over chapter one, or at least the sections that we're doing. I can't remember now. One to 1.1 to 1.4, I think. We'll see how long they take us. All right, but otherwise, see you later, alligators. <laughs>